said turn the book of Haggai, you're going, what is that? Uh, many of you have never been there, maybe. That's okay. It's a good opportunity. You might want to start in the book of Matthew and then back into Haggai between uh, Zephaniah and Zechariah in the Old Testament. That's on page uh, 1,142, if you have an Oxford Wide Margin Bible. And I will, you, you were permitted to go to the front if you do not know how to find it and look in the index. It's only two chapters, so um, it's a, it is difficult to find, if you, especially if you've never been there. And so uh, I'll give you a moment to get there. But uh, I do apologize if you're already for Romans. Don't wait. It is coming. It is coming, but it won't be coming this week. Um, I was so excited in my anticipation. But, you know, I really I was praying about what we really need to have today. Uh, and God really was clear that um, we need to be focused uh, on what's coming up this next week. And I didn't want to, uh, there was certain I could have made everything fit together, but I really wanted to take some time and just share with you why and what God is, is showing me from Haggai chapter 2, which is this uh, coming week, not this week, but next week will be the theme of our vision conference. And our vision conference, uh, we do that annually, and, and sometimes when you do things repetitiously, you just kind of, oh yeah, it's another vision conference. Uh, but, beloved, that is, that is a time in our church where we focus. We, it's the only time of the year, by the way, where we do not uh, have, we do not care for the children. Uh, the church of Mama comes down, Maple City Baptist comes down, our sister church, and they care for our children for us, and that is the only time as a church family we can enjoy the, the privilege of sitting together as one unit uh, in the church body, and we're not divided up. <clears throat> every service we have, including our Bible hours at 9 o'clock, biblical instruction that believers live every day, those classes, uh, those, uh, those classes are, are manned uh, uh, with people over here in, uh, in our children's ministry. We have people working with the children Wednesday night, Sunday. And so, really, this vision conference week is a time to allow those that are so faithful and uh, so few oftentimes to, to be able to get a little rest, to sit and just get the Word of God soaked up. It's also a time for me to come in here. Uh, but there's a reason that we need to do that. <clears throat> it's not because we need to be just pumped up and encouraged, though we, we need all that. But we really need to listen to what God is tell, telling us as a church body because God is setting before our church opportunities. Uh, and I often say, why should we reach the world with the gospel? Whether that be your next door neighbor, your coworker, or your family member, or uh, the uttermost parts of the earth. Uh, uh, why should we do that? <clears throat> Frankly, if you really think about it, it is because we can. Uh, and oftentimes we are uh, not really, we really don't grasp oftentimes the great opportunities that God has set before us. Just uh, to be born in a country like this and the opportunities that we have despite the economy. Despite this, despite all that, I know there's always challenges and there always will be, but really God has given us a unique opportunity, along with many other churches, by the way, uh, but I'm the pastor of this church, to, to, uh, to accomplish God's mission. And so I'm excited about that. And I'm excited about our time when we come together and we focus on what it is God wants us to hear. What does he want us to know? And have you ever felt stagnant? Uh, I mean, you wake up today and it's cloudy. I'm, I'm impressed everyone showed up, right? I'm glad you're not fair weather to, uh, fans, so to speak, and uh, you're committed to, to getting to where you need to be to do what you need to do. But sometimes in life, you kind of get to where you feel stagnant, right? Uh, the way I operate, uh, God has given me an ability to, uh, I think, I think on the macro, big picture, and I try to bring it down to a micro to where we can function, and uh, so we can chew up big things uh, in relative time. Hopefully before Jesus comes to accomplish things and glorify him. Uh, in that processing and processing, what happens is sometimes you get into patterns, right? Uh, I operate in cycles oftentimes, and I, and I see that. that's the way God creates things. There's seasons, there's four seasons, there's cycles. And you know what happens uh, is that sometimes you get stuck in what you call a, a, a rut, right? A, a spin cycle. I, I, I preach sermons where people get stuck in the sin cycle. And they go around and around, you know what I mean? They just get, it's a cycle of sin. Uh, when I was preaching at the mission years ago, I would see men, and I would know as I'm ministering to them, as I'm, as I'm loving them, as I'm encouraging them, that they're going to go back, most likely, uh, to the sin cycle. But they'll also come back around. Even people kind of go in cycles in life. And one of the things that's important for us is to understand that the only thing that really breaks us out of that is the liberty that we have in Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ himself who broke into this world through the love of God, 
since God sending his only son has allowed us to be free from sin, to be set apart for the purposes of God. So we're not just, we're not robots, right? This isn't natural selection. This is a, we, live, we, we are in a unique and dynamic situation as new creatures in Christ Jesus. Behold, we are the sons of God. And if that's not yet occurred, we shall be. I mean, we have so much to look forward to. It truly is unbelievable. I would lay out as many of us really don't grasp or comprehend fully what God has done in us and what he plans to do with us in all of eternity. I mean, we could just stop the service today and go on hold for the next million years and meditate upon that. Because God is that glorious. He has a lot of things that he can and will and is planning to do with us. And so what we need to do is find out where God's at and go where he's going and join him in his work. Because that's really the only thing that matters is who he is and what he's doing. And praise God, he gives us opportunity to be part of that. And this morning, um, you may say, Brian, that is so far away from me. I mean, my life is falling apart. Uh, this has gone wrong. That's gone wrong. This isn't right. That isn't right. I'm ready to quit. I just want to give up. Uh, I've tried the Christian thing now. I'm tired of that. I know all the basics. I know the knowledge. I got the information. I went to all the classes. Okay. Now what? What? What is Jesus? Do you know him? The power of his resurrection. Are you communion with him? Because I tell you, when you're right, when you're right with God, man, it is fresh every day. It's not just about a religion of knowledge. We're not Gnostics around here. It's about a relationship with him. So first, we've got to remember some things. We've got to remember who we are in Christ. You know that the, the ministry, and this, this is something that's in our culture. You've got to, I'm going to let this one sink in a second. Ministry is not a right. It's a privilege. You know that church in Laodicea, Laodicea writes to the people, right? <laughs> they get to say, ah, oh, it's this, listen, ministry is an invitation. It's, it's an opportunity that we receive. I don't have a right, I have, you guys know me, I have no right standing here this morning to tell you anything. But it is a privilege. I, I am so, I was just sitting here, we're singing, beautiful singing, by the way, praise the Lord. Amen. And I'm just sitting there, oh, man, what an opportunity for me, just what a blessing I don't want to be in any other church. I love HDF. It's a great, you guys are the greatest church I know. And I know I'm just partial, but, uh, you know, the reality is you really are. I mean, you're, there's a lot of good churches, and you're one of them, all right? And, uh, and that has no bearing on me. That's just because God, God is good, and, and he loves us. And you know what? I think most of you, probably most of you do understand that it is a, pri it is a privilege to serve the Lord. But sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes... We get tired, right? That's why Paul had to exhort the body at times. Be not weary of well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And and, and uh, I know y'all are busy, right? The Thirty plus of you were out doing the uh, mission dinner yesterday. That ended up being awesome. God's working in our community. Man, God is good. And uh, you know, part of the maturity process is when the when and I can remember distinctly in my own walk with the Lord, when all the new kind of wore off. Anybody ever been there? Yeah. So you get saved, it's exciting, it's fresh, it's vibrant. <laughs> uh, that's over. <laughs> that's over. It's not, as, it's not as exciting anymore, man. This is like, because uh, there's new people, and I'm the old person, and, you know, everyone ever have kids? <laughs> you know? Once you have your kids, right, life changes. It's not about you anymore. It's about the, the babies, raising them up. It's part of the maturation process. It's about, being, it's about growing up. And it's neat in our church because you can see different people in different phases. And, and I can distinctly remember that, that moment in my life. I can actually remember a place where I was, I was like at a point of a decision. Um, and I was a young man. I was still in senior high school. I had to decide if I go this path, I am going to go back, and I knew it in my heart. And that included the popularity, the parties, all that. The kind of just going back in the groove where I came from. Or I'm actually going to go forward on faith because I really, if I go this path, I'm not quite sure where it's going. I mean, I'm not seeing it quite as clearly, right? But when I look behind me, I see that path. I know where that's going. And uh, even though I don't know where that thing's going, I'm going to take it. Even though kind of the news worn off and, and 
but I'm going to, by faith, I'm going to step out, I'm going to take that next step. And so I quit. I quit being the captain of the wrestling team. That's a big step for me. Told the coach I'm checking out. Sir, yes, sir. I'm going to go to these two classes. I'm going to learn the Bible. That's what God called me to do. It didn't make any sense. It didn't make sense to one of my, my Christian friends. They're like, oh, go ahead and do that. Senior year, you're the wrestling captain. Yeah, I would do that, but God told me not to. He told me to invest somewhere. I need to do this, and I don't really know why, but I'm going to do it anyway. I mean, I know I need to learn the Word, and I just think now is the time. God in time blessed that decision, and it was important for me to disconnect at that time and go forward, even though I didn't always feel good about it. We've got to remember that it was the opportunity. See, it was this opportunity to be able to, to know the Bible and, and be able to communicate it because there was this problem. If you lead someone to Christ, but then you don't know what to do with them. That is just such much, it's so much more important than anything else. I mean, what, 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 what profits me if I, if I go off and I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I do what I want to do, but I can't actually take somebody in the Bible and get them where they need to go? And I wasn't a pastor. Right? I'm just a person. Like, y'all, that, that became an overriding issue in my heart. And I'm like, man, i got to go forward. i gotta, I got to sow the word. There is a need for the seed. There's a need for the seed, guys. There's a need for the seed of God's word to be implanted in the hearts of people. And the way God designed it is he uses us. He uses us. Does he need us? No, but he uses us. He gives us the opportunity. It's a privilege. And we obey God. And oftentimes we feel that way. But man, what an opportunity. But can I go forward? I mean, really, can I go forward? Can I take the next step? Oftentimes we feel that way because we've not appreciated the faith that has been delivered to us through the Lord Jesus Christ or those that have gone before us. Like Esther, we, we need a swift kick from Uncle Mordecai at times. To say, listen, wake up, wake up, Esther. Listen, it's for such a time as this. <laughs> you don't know where deliverance is coming, but you need to do your part. You have been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. We live in a world and a society that is always promoting the new and improved. And it's almost, it makes the tried and tested seem as, as something of, of, of being obsolete. They, oh, new and improved, new and improved, new and improved. But the tried and the tested, well, we don't have time for that anymore. It's not as shiny. It doesn't have the varnish. The, the varnish is worn off. Listen, beloved, the, the tried and the true is the word of God. If you want to be new and improved, you must come back to the tried and the true word of God. People look for refreshing, and they look to the right, and they look to the left. But the only place of refreshing that you're really going to find in time or eternity is in this book. Amen. amen. I like some amens. It's in the Word of God. Beloved, that's exactly what's happened in the nation of Israel time and time again. After the miraculous delivery from the bondage in Babylon, a remnant returns to establish worship, which you guys are well aware of after going through Ezra, on that temple mount. And we studied in Ezra, and we saw that God did a mighty work through the returning Hebrews. However, it didn't take long to become complacent. And just like the second generation that left uh, Egypt and entered the Promised Land, instead of following success with diligent expansion of God's work, forward progress was replaced with apathy, apostasy, and eventually anarchy. And you guys remember, we went through the book of Judges and we saw that. It just kind of got lazy, kind of got apathetic, the new worn off. The promises of God were gorgeous in the wilderness. But once we had some victories under our belt, once we got in the land, once we got some houses to live in, once we kind of got settled in, well then, you know, the battle's really not, uh, that, that's a damn right to have that mountain over there. The expansion process just kind of slowed to a stop. And then apostasy set in after apathy. And then after the apostasy comes, they're worshiping right along with the pagans. The next thing you know, there's complete anarchy. The book of Judges ends with a, a civil war. Now you have to step back as a believer. And you sit back and you say, ah, I see the handprint of God and I see the, the counteraction of the devil. Because you see, the pattern that you see in Israel is the same pattern that we experience as individuals. 
Because we're agents of God's kingdom, just as the Old Testament nation of Israel was. They were called the son of God. We as individuals are the sons of God as, as we receive Jesus as our Savior. And so God looks at us, and, and we see the same processes where there's great victories, but if we're not diligent, if we don't stay in the Word of God, what happens is, is that apostasy comes in because we're apathetic, and, and the next thing you know, there's an anarchy. And the first civil war that you're going to fight is the one uh, not between your husband and your wife, or you and your kids, but it's between you and your flesh. And you're divided on the inside because you're not walking in the Spirit. And then you have a hard time uh, conquering the, the, the lust of the flesh. And by the way, beloved, your lust of the flesh will be with you until you die. So gird up the loins of your mind. Put on the whole armor of God. And understand, listen, beloved, we must be in the Word of God. We must walk in the Spirit. We must pray. We must fellowship. Listen to me. There is no time to, to take a vacation because the, the adversary is at work. And you are in a real battle. But if he can lull you to sleep, he can lull you into apostasy. If he can lull you into apostasy, it won't be long. You'll be in the anarchy. Then your individual life will become a sham. And the devil will whisper in your ears, you see, I told you, you're just like me. Who is your, who is your daddy, right? He is you on the mat, whispering that in your ear. And you need help. You need help. But when you don't get the help you need, when you don't come back to the basics of the tried and the true and the tested, what you do is you go on, and then the next thing you know, the husband is, is, is hurting the wife, and the wife is hurting the husband, and, and then they're hurting the kids, and, and the whole thing's falling apart, and the devil is going where he really wants to go, and that is to destroy innocence. We deserve destruction, but our kids don't. And so then the devil's working there, fighting against the will of God. And you know what happens? The civil war breaks out. Marriages are busted. Marriages are broke. And then the devil can. He'll fight the war on all the fronts. Next thing you know, he'll be in the local church. And he'll have brother against brother, sister against sister. And there'll be civil war among the congregation of the Lord. Anybody ever seen that? Yeah, it's usually over something completely ridiculous and petty. It's not like the issues of the deity of Christ or of some doctrinal truth that, that, that's just un, unwavering. It's over something silly like the color of the carpet or, or the, the way the church government works or something that, that has no bearing on eternity. What the devil has done is we've allowed it to happen. The news worn off. And we need something tried and true. I was just reading in my personal reading this morning and uh, looking at the battle after Ai there, the Gibeonites come. Everybody in the, in the new land is afraid. You know what? Joshua made a critical mistake. I almost made it this last week. Myself. So I'm, I'm sympathetic to him. He almost went in with it. He, he, he made a deal with the Gibeonites uh, without praying first. It came to bite him in the hook. You didn't think I was going to say that, did you? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't pray, man. And that nagged him and nagged him. He was moving without the Spirit of God. David learned the lesson later on. He, he, man, David was always inquiring of the Lord before he went to battle. Always. I, I tell you, I almost made this week. I was almost in Romans. You saw me. I'm posting that. I'm going. I'm, and God said, Brian, listen to me. We need to go back. I'm like, yes, sir. It's easy to do. Listen to the Lord. Realize the battle is real. Realize that you are a change agent if you're born again. God does not, you need to understand this. He, he created you to be victorious. I'm not a prosperity preacher, but listen, I know God wants to prosper you, even if it hurts. Even if it's through death, and even if it's through destruction, and even if it's through anguish, God still wants to prosper us. Because he is good, no matter what the circumstances are. Man, bless God when you're infertile and you can't have kids. Why? Because there's a blessing coming. Don't forsake the Lord. It's not his fault. He's good. Exalt his character when things go bad. Praise the Lord. I'm suffering. Praise the Lord. I don't get what I want when I want it. Anyone want to sign up for that ministry? <laughs> Amen. I'm telling you, if you can go there, if you can go there in your heart and you can say, God, with all my heart, praise you when I don't get what I want. Thank you because your ways are better than my ways. Thank you for being my Lord. Thank you for controlling my life. Thank you for setting me in motion and making me uncomfortable. Praise God. Amen. I'm telling you, there's a liberty in that. There's a freedom in that. There is a blessing in that. Maybe some of you understand what I'm talking about all too well. 
made a vow with your husband or your wife. And they're so beautiful. Now you feel like you're sleeping with the enemy. Hey, listen. You better stop. Because like all Israel, what they did is they lost their purpose. They lost their mission. They lost the point. They lost it. And then they were in vain, in vain jangling. Man, it was just vanity. As that song said, you're created for more than all of this. You are set apart to build God's house, to establish the beachhead in the kingdom of God, to see God accomplish his mission on earth. You must believe me this morning. Even if you're lost and going to hell, God has more for you. And he desires to bless you. Even if you haven't come to the point where you've yielded your heart to him, I want you to know God loves you. He's already provided for you. He wants more for you. Not in a, a monetary or physical way necessarily, but much more importantly, he desires you to participate in the bounty of sowing the seed of God's word. Which leads me to my text finally. If you have your Bible, look in Haggai chapter 2, verse 18. The prophet Haggai is, is speaking the words of the Lord to the children of Israel who have now been in Babylon and are tasked with going forward and restoring worship. Tell you a little bit more about that in just a moment. But I want you to look at these words in verse 18 and 19 of Haggai chapter 2. He says, Consider now from this day and upward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed yet in the barn? Yea, and as yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree have not brought forth from brought forth. From this day will I bless you. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne this morning and we pause and ask you to speak to our hearts as individuals, uh, as, a na as, a, as a group of people, uh, collectively the local New Testament church. Heavenly Father, we, we yield ourselves to you collectively to hear your word, not just today, but this coming week as we begin our vision conference. Lord, I pray that you continue to prepare the hearts of all who will speak, that you will be glorified. Lord, I pray for this time, Lord, that in everything that we do, that you would just connect with us in a very special way, that you would speak to hearts as only you can, that you would open up your word and your will to us, that we would be encouraged today by your word, through your word. Thank you and praise and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Haggai chapter 2. Simple passage. It's pregnant with meaning today. Haggai is a minor prophet. Not because he's little. But, uh, well, not because he's insignificant, I should say. But because it's a smaller book. One of the, all the smaller prophets are put in the back there. And the bigger ones, Jeremiah and Isaiah, are toward the front. These uh, two chapters, between Zephaniah and Zechariah, have a lot of things that we can glean this morning. But I want to just focus on the need for seed. And there's three points I'm going to make this morning. First of all, we need to consider our ways. Then we need to consider God's word. And third, we need to consider God's work. Now, turn with me back to chapter 1, which won't take you far. And I want you to look at this situation here. This is the second year of Darius in verse 1. He's the king. It's in the sixth month of the first day. So all these things are time. The year is 520 B.C. Uh, on September 1st. And Haggai, the prophet, receives a vision. And you'll see that it's the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Sheetel, governor of Judah, and Joshua, who's also called Jeshua and Ezra, the son of Josedek, the high priest. And this is what he tells him. He says, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then come the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, It is time for you, O ye, to dwell in is it time for you? Question mark, I'm sorry. Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Ye you have so much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe, but there is not warm. And 
he that earneth wages, or he that earneth wages, to put in a bag with, with holes. Anybody identify with that? As gas prices go up, up, and away. He says in verse 7, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your, your ways. Both in verse 5 and verse 7, he says, Consider your ways. So what is going on here? Well, God is chastening through verse 15 at the end of this chapter the children of Israel who had arrived <clears throat> and began building their homes and neglected the house of God, which was an important uh, feature for God's uh, prosperity there and worship being restored in the nation of Israel and to the world. They were not busy about the business that God had set them free to be busy about. They began to build their own things. God tells Israel that he will not bless them in their disobedience, through verses 7 through 10. I'm not going to read those this morning for time's sake. But he says, listen, guys, uh, until you correct this, I'm not going to bless this. So he wanted to deal with their priorities. He tells them twice, consider your ways. He's not saying, hey, consider my ways. Why? Because they already know what they're supposed to do. They already knew what was supposed to be done. They didn't have to sit around and, and, uh, and pontificate and wonder, what is it that God wants us to do? He makes it very clear. Build my house. Build my house. That's what you're to be doing. <clears throat> Not build your house. Build my house. Is it time for you to build your house when mine is, is, is in shambles? And so the, me the, the message stirs the Hebrew governor. And he arrives in Babylon under the command of Cyrus. The rule begins that work. 24 days after the vision comes through to Haggai. God's work is underway. When you get to verse 14, look at that. It says, And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheathil, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of jo uh, Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did the work of the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, in the four and twentieth day of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. So on the 24th day, 24 days later, the leader is stirred up. The whole congregation is stirred up. Joshua the priest is stirred up. Picture of Jesus Christ, right? And, and they are getting the work done of building the house. It doesn't take that long. Let me just encourage you. It doesn't take that long to turn things around when you really receive the message of God. It doesn't take that long. God goes to work. Now, I'm not saying there aren't nagging issues, and there is in the life of Israel. But God didn't want them on it. He didn't want to just sit around and beat them or put them in time out for another 70 years. They'd already gone through that. It was time for them to get up and take advantage of the opportunities that God had for them. There are some of you that, that man, that's where you've got to get in your relationship with Christ. To realize that you really are not an addict. You are really not this. You're really not this. You are a son of God. You are a child of the living God. And he has called you on up out of that mess. And so applying the word of God, you know what to do now, right? And so it's availing yourself. And you're going, why am I still struggling? Why am I still struggling? Because you're focusing on who you're not. Instead of who you are. You are a child of God. He's got purposes for your life. You need to get on them. Because the clock is ticking. You are free. Use your freedom. Not as an occasion of the flesh. But serve the Lord. Love God and love his people. <coughs> so that's the first message that comes to the nation of Israel. Through Haggai. And then in chapter 2 you see the second message. On October 21st. A few months later. In 520 B.C. In the seventh month. And. One of the, the, the 20, in the 1 and 20th day of the month came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, <coughs> Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Question mark. Is it not in your eyes in comparison as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek. The high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, saith the Lord, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. He says, as you're building this temple, the footprint is just not as big as Solomon's. The, the plans do not look nothing like Solomon's. You guys are discouraged. And the Lord pipes in and he says, Listen, don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged because you're doing this at my command. I'm pleased with what we're building here. And then he lays in, I don't have time to lay into it. But he lays into a messianic prophecy that I don't think Haggai even understood. Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. What's being pictured there? What's being pictured there is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Because he came to this earth and they looked at him and they said, is this the Messiah? This dude? He wasn't much to look at. He just looked like a man. Yeah, that's all right. He was the God man. 
He was the God man. He is exactly what God ordered. He was God in the flesh. The nation of Israel sees him, and they're like, this is the Messiah? Come on, he's from Galilee. He's not, he can't be the Messiah. They look narrowly upon the Lord himself, despite the power of God, despite the fact that he was the word of God, despite the fact that God said, this is my beloved son, and whom I'm well pleased. And so you look at your responsibilities, and well, they're not big enough, they're not grand enough, they're not as good as what I could do, or as good as they should be. Listen, it's a privilege to be in the work of the ministry. It's not about scale. It's about obedience to the Lord's command. And so God tells them to continue to build, be encouraged, go forward. Even though there was some discouragement, continue on. Why? 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 Because he's going to come with another message. He's going to tell them some things about themselves. In verse 10, in the 420th day, December 24th, 520 B.C., in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet. As thus saith the Lord of hosts. And by the way, let me pause. In verse 9, he says, hey, the glory of the latter house should be greater than the former, saith the Lord of hosts. I'm sure the angels looked down on Jesus Christ and they compared him to the first Adam, who was probably lit up like a Christmas tree in his glory before the fall of the sin. And you see the last Adam, Jesus Christ, show up in a, in, a, in, a, in a manger. They had to be going, what in the world? And the father turns and says, hey, you just wait. You ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. The glory of this one is going to be a lot better than the last one. Of course, it's not that they're the same, but you get the point. And then he comes with another message, and he says, Hey, ask now the priest concerning the law, saying, If, if one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and, and his skirt does, uh, do touch bread, or pottage, or wine, or oil, or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priest answered and said, No. And then said Haggai, If one that is unclean be a dead by, uh, by a dead body, touch any of these, shall it be unclean? The priest answered and said, it shall be unclean. Then answered Haggai and said, so is this people, and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, and the work which they offer, theirs is unclean. And now I pray you, consider, here's this word consider, from this day and upward, from before a stone was laid upon the stone of the temple of the Lord, since those days were, when one came to the heap of twenty measures, there was but ten. When one came to the press basket to draw out the fifty vessels out of the press, there was but twenty. I smote you with blasting, and with mildew, and with hail, in all the labors of your hands. Yet, yet, you turn not to me, saith the Lord. There's a second message that is given. And then a third message. He says, man, guys, you're not getting my blessing. I'm not pouring it out. Why? Because you're defiled. I may be holy, but you're not. Be ye holy, for I am holy. And then he says it again. Consider now. From this day on and upward. Consider. In the end of verse 18. I, he ends verse 19. I will bless you. That third message, God uses to encourage the nation of Israel to let them know that he indeed does reward obedience to the sacrifices, to the law that he had set up in the Old Testament. Before we go forward here with the, the need to sow the seed, I'd like to ask you to consider some things that, that may hinder you from the opportunity of having a blessing in your life. Twice in this book, the, the admonition Consider your ways as issued by the Lord through Haggai. Before we can sow anything, before we start sowing anything, I would, I would take an admonition. Before you get excited about sowing anything, can we consider our ways? Can we consider our ways? Any blessing Satan provides is a mirage. If Christ <coughs> is not the foundation upon which your eternal soul rests, I'm not saying consider your circumstances or consider your wealth or consider what you perceive to be blessings. I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to consider your ways 
and then contrast them to his ways and see where they, where they measure up. And even though I've been saved now for almost a quarter of a century, now you know what I realized? That even as long as I got this flesh on, there is no comparison. There is no blessing, there is no goodness in my life apart from the goodness of God that brings down and he brings down through his son, through his word, through his spirit. I'm not holy by the works that I do, through the ministry I perform, through the things that I know. I'm holy because he's holy. I'm saved because he saved me. I'm free because I put my faith in his faith. He set me apart. He finished the work. He did all that needed to be done. You are holy because Jesus Christ is holy. The work is done. But we should just quit then and go home. No, no, not at all. We should, we should honor him and thank him for the privilege of being used of God. Before you consider your end, or before you begin, I'm sorry, please consider your end. Have you done that? Have you considered your end? It's very possible that you came in this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Savior. And you don't really even know what that means, maybe. I know I used to not understand those terms. But you, you're in a place in your life where this whole thing, you're where you, Brian, you're bringing stuff. I, I just want to, I, I just sense that I, I'm apart from God. I need, to be, I need to be His and He needs to be mine. But I don't even know how to get there. Listen, the Holy Spirit of God is telling you, you must be born again. You need to be saved. You need to repent. You need to come to Him. Because He wants your soul for all of eternity. And you must understand it. it's in the grip of hell. It's in the grip of Satan. Until you acknowledge your sin and you turn to Him. He sets you free. When you acknowledge your sin, you are returning to Him, by the way. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and verse 9. The Bible says, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For the foundation, for other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon the foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. I, I stopped right there. I wanted to, uh, you keep going, and uh, you're going to find out that the stubble is going to last, is going to be burnt, and the gold and silver and the precious stones are not. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And uh, I don't know what's up there and what's not because the back screen's not working. But uh, you want to invest in things uh, that are upon the foundation of Christ. Our foundation is Jesus Christ. If Jesus is not your foundation, then any endeavor you engage in will ultimately result in, in loss. This is the point of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you're not investing in Christ, then you know what? You're going you're to suffer loss. Consider Jesus' words as you consider your ways. Matthew 16 and verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. It's kind of counterintuitive, isn't it? For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What does it profit us if we don't acknowledge Christ, if we don't follow Christ? Maybe this morning you're one that needs to allow Jesus Christ to be the foundation of your life, and you need to build your life upon that. Hey, listen, today is the day of salvation, because you will not profit. You will suffer loss if you do not, if you do not come to him. The foundation of Christ can be laid in a moment, and you yield your life to him. Jim Elliott, the martyr in Peru, the Alga Indians, he said years before he actually died, he wrote in his journal, he is no fool who gives that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. And there's no truer words. He is no fool who gives that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. And you know, we need to understand that as we come to Christ as Lord and Savior, but as Christians, we also must continuously repeat that and understand that you know what God is calling us to be a living sacrifice, holy what's it say in 1 Corinthians 12 holy, acceptable unto God which is our reasonable service 
Why am I not blessing y'all? Well, listen, because you're not holy. Be holy for I am holy. Though the believer's foundation is secure in Christ, we must ensure that we are doing the work to build as commanded by the Lord. We cannot sow if we do not lay the foundation. Doing our part to lay the foundation of Christ is paramount to the battle for the blood-bought souls purchased by Jesus Christ. In the book of Psalms, David was speaking. He says, In the Lord put I my trust. How say you to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? How dare you tell me to retreat? He says, For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string. They may privily shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The, for the Lord is, is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids try the children of men. Beloved, what's going on in this world right now for those of us that are believing especially is there is a trial going on. And oftentimes it is difficult. Oftentimes it is, it is hard. And God is saying, listen, listen, I'm beholding the good and the evil. Be upright in heart. Stand ye therefore. Gird up the loins of your mind. Put on the whole armor of God. Would you just stand? Would you believe me at my word? Would you go forward in faith? Because if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? You stand upon a sure foundation. You stand upon that rock, which is Jesus Christ. There is no retreat. So if there's something going wrong, listen, hey, let it go wrong. But you make sure you stand on the rock, which is Christ. And don't budge. Because the enemy wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy the souls of every man, woman, and child that's ever come into existence. And you are in a great conflict, whether you believe it or not. And you're not just in it. God's calling you to get up off the bench and engage in a mighty way. Because he needs you to serve him. If you're not building upon the foundation and thoroughly furnishing the temple of God, why would you expect God to bless your efforts? You cannot lose your salvation, but you can risk your joy. I mean, come on. He tells us to be thoroughly furnished into all good works. Some of you need to come to the place where you just furnish the inside. Give the Holy Spirit of God something to work with. Give it, I'm pleading with you. Give him something inside of that temple, that body that he can use to minister to other people. Put the word of God in so that it can come out. The problem with some of us is not that there's seed in the barn. Some of you need to get the seed in there. And others of you, you're so full of seed that, man, if you don't get it out, you're going to go to rot. That seed is not to stay in your barn. It's to get out. Get the word out. That goes for me, too, by the way. In John chapter 15, Jesus speaking, he says, If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I love you. But wait a minute, I mean, that's sacrificial. How can I be joyful when I'm giving? Because I only have joy when I'm receiving. <laughs> you could just miss the whole point. Right? It's supernatural when you step over the line. Because you can only do that by faith. I want to follow Christ. Really? Be ready to be a giver, not a taker. But see, this is what happens. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But when you go in with that attitude, you're going to receive a blessing. You're going to have more fruit than you know what to do with. He said in verse 5 and verse 7 of chapter 1, Consider your ways, Israel. Consider your ways. God gives us opportunity in his infinite mercy to turn our lives around and follow him. Even if you're like Peter who chose, even if you were like Peter who failed, you can still choose to love God. Obey him if he's calling you today. You may say, Brian, I'm a, I'm a wretch. I'm a, I'm a misery. I don't deserve another step. <laughs> hey, listen, none of us do. Praise the Lord. So, okay, you're good. Now, get right and go forward. You, 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 yeah, but Brian, I haven't been faithful. You don't understand. I haven't, I haven't honored the Lord. Okay, so what? Jesus paid for that on the cross. The issue is, you're gonna, are you going to honor him by taking him at his word? Jesus rolls into that third, uh, or God rolls into that third, uh, that third message and saying, listen guys, you're not holy, but I'm still going to bless you. Why? Because I'm God. <coughs> Consider the 
consider God's word. Look at verse 18. So he's told him, he says, hey, consider your ways in verse 5. Consider your ways in verse 7. He says in verse 15, now I pray you consider this day and upward. He says, okay, I'm going to put a, a mark on the wall right now today. April 15th, half day, 2012. Today and upward. What are you going to do today and upward? Consider. Right now. Now we can apply that today. I'm not just saying this. Hear myself. Consider. What am I, what am I going to do from this day and upward? Some of you are, have a, such a, you're, you're walking with God. You've got a clean conscience. What you need to say, I'm going to do what I've been doing. I'm going to walk with God. I'm going to love God with all my heart, my mind, my soul, my strength, my neighbor, and myself. I'm, and you have that confidence like First John talks about, right? Because you've been loving God. He's loving you. Hey, stay in that track. Be content. Godliness with contentment is what? Great game. You stay right there. But others of you, when you think about from this day forward, you know as you, as you think that. As that pop off the page into your heart, you know that there are some things in your life that from this day upward, they must change if you want to see any fruit come out of that barn. Before the seed goes out, you need to make a decision from this day and upward. This day and upward. Do you want to see the blessing of the Lord? Because you don't want to get the seed out of the barn. Why? Because when you go out to tell someone about Jesus, your testimony stinks to high heaven. That's why you don't want to get the seed out of the barn. It's because you're ashamed of your walk with God. And I'm not going to let you off the hook. Change that today. You understand me? I'm not, I love you. I'm not saying that to get on your case. But beloved, for the sake of other people's souls, get right because you may be the greatest vessel God has ever seen. He doesn't have to use flimsy old fat old guys like me, man. He needs you in the battle. You can't get the seed out of the barn because you haven't decided that you're willing to walk with him. Even though he's redeemed your soul. Make a decision from this day and upward. I don't know what it takes to move you. I hope it doesn't take a loss, a child, a parent, a husband, a wife, a car wreck. But God, I tell you what, he withheld blessing from his children on purpose. Why? To get them to wake up and understand they needed to be right with him. I don't even know who I'm speaking to this morning, but for goodness sake, for God's sake, literally, would you listen to the word of God? Would you repent? Because God wants to bless you. He wants to bless you mightily. Now consider how God is good for his word. This is not a prosperity promise like you see on TBN. This is a promise that comes to those who understand God's mission. We must get the seed out of the barn because God is going to bless it. Therefore, if you don't get the seed out of the barn, guess what? It ain't going to be there to get blessed. Yeah. I know God's sovereign, and he's provincial. He gives everything we need. But beloved, he also says, wake up and grab that seed and get it out. Get something done. Get that thing sown. Like Spurgeon said, man, he was a, you don't know who's going to get saved, so sow the seed. It's not possible to see blessings in the field if we don't sow seed in the field. It's pretty simple, right? God promises to bless his word in a very literal way. In Isaiah chapter 55, a familiar passage to most of us, the prophet says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. You say, Brian, I'm not smart enough for all this. Well, guess what? You don't have to be. Just concede from the beginning. His, thought, his ways are better than yours, and his thoughts are better than, uh, than your thoughts, and you're right on track. Sometimes it's the smart ones that have a problem. For as the rain <clears throat> cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but the water that watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sin it. If you read that carefully, you see that the propagation of the word also produces seed. Seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Eventually, you know why a lot of believers are starving? Because they're not sowing. 
That's why they're starving. They're not selling. If the problem has never been the Word of God, the problem is often the holiness of those who carry it. Those that are they're not set apart. We're often not set apart. And that goes for me as well. I don't want to point the finger at you. But the Word of God doesn't impact our heart. We will not be successful in sowing the seed in the, in the hearts of others. Yeah, I know the Word won't turn void, and it won't. But man, God wants you to get the blessing. He wants you to be part of it. In Matthew 13, the Bible clearly defines the word as, or the seed as the word of God. God. God calls upon us, as he did the children of Israel, to believe in the blessing that comes from obedience. And just as God asked Israel to consider the results of obedience and disobedience, he emphasizes the power of his promise by asking Israel to consider the opportunity for me to bless you. Would you consider that? The devil's told you, man, you're not worth blessing. Well, that's a lie. God wants to bless you. Do you believe that <clears throat> you have a need for seed? Hey, sometimes to go forward, it will require a step of faith. God says, hey, listen, I am going to bless you. So the word. By faith, they have to believe what God says and do what he says, regardless of how they feel about it. They've got to do that. There's a need to sow the seed. Consider our ways. Consider God's word. And then lastly, consider God's will. Verse 19. Is the seed yet in the barn? It's the vision conference verse. Carol will be preaching on the theme or that concept next week. Not this coming week, but the following. Obedience brings blessing. That's really what he's telling in verse 18. Listen, guys, do what I tell you. There's a blessing coming from this day forward. Just do what you're supposed to do, and they were going to be there. <coughs> because it's my principles. God, I've set this thing in motion. This is how it works. You honor me, I honor you, because you're bringing glory to, to my kingdom. God, that's what's going on. Consider the responsibility of God's blessing. Now, that, that promise brings a responsibility. <laughs> God is asking a question which requires a response. Is the seed still in the barn? Of course, we know that the barn was a place of storage. They had seed barns, and they would have places of seed, shelves of seed. They would have uh, systematic, they would divide the seeds so they could sow different things. Not just, uh, you know, corn or wheat, but uh, they would sow, you know, obviously he talked about the vine plants and all the different things that he had there, the olive trees. Have you given out what you've taken in? Some of you, maybe God's calling you to teach the word of God. Maybe there's a new believer or a young family, a young couple coming in. Maybe there's a child in the nursery or the, in, the, in the caterpillars or somewhere. And God needs you to start to get out some of the information that he's put in. You know, how many of you know this today? You learn a lot more by teaching than you ever do by receiving. Amen? Amen. 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 <clears throat> and that's, that's where God wants to bless you. So you're putting it out, and the next thing you know, you're receiving a blessing. And then, you know what that does? It primes the spiritual crop, and you're loving on the Lord. It's wonderful. You'll see fruit. But there's work required, isn't there? It's not like the glorious days when you were a baby Christian, and everyone just took you up in their arms, and they start doing this to you, like we're going to do with the baby dedication. And if you need to go down, put the baby bottle in your mouth. No. It's not like that anymore. Now need to prepare your own meal. There's some work. you got to like get up and read your Bible. you got to plan. you gotta, you got to put some energy into it. Let me tell you, beloved, it's worth it to get the seed out of the barn. You sow by faith, and you reap with joy. Get the seed out while there is opportunity. Sow some tears over that thing. Cry over that thing. And see what God brings forth from that. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 4, the Bible says, The sun will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg and harvest and have nothing. Today many will say, well, Brian, you don't understand. You, you, can't, you can't do the tried and tested anymore. You need some modern things that you need to do so that people will get it. And, hey, I'm not opposed to all that stuff. And I know culture changes. And I know your, your attention span is only 15 minutes, so I can't preach 60. I understand all that. But the reality is this. This is tried and true. It's tried and true. The Word of God has an impact. Beloved, it is a lie that we must override the promises of God's word. 
or to return with any promise. That is not true. We stay in the word of God. That is what keeps the thing going forward. We sow the word everywhere and in every way. There is no greater time in history of humanity. Get this. There is no greater time in the history of humanity, in my opinion. This is my opinion. But I don't think there's any greater time in the history of humanity than right now to sow the word. Right now, there are ways to sow the word that we've never had before. There is, I can talk to people overseas on the internet, man. It's incredible. This is the prime time to sow the word. But there's work. It takes work. It takes energy. It's not the, listen, it's not the job for professional preachers. It takes laborers in this field. It takes everybody getting hands on and getting the word out. It's God's sons. It's God's children to get it done. No greater time to do it than now. We consider the reward of God's blessing, the result of getting the seed out of the barn, and provide much fruit, fruit that remains. God has given us an opportunity to invest in the soil that He has provided, even in our posterity. Man, how are we investing in? I think about this even with my kids. How am I investing the Word in my kids? That seed that I want to get in their little hearts. Matthew 13. And I want to see fruit, and much fruit, fruit that remains. You got a plan for that? Well, hey, from this day up forward, get one. It's not, I can tell you where to find it, though. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and start reading. You'll, you'll see the plan laid out right there. We can hardly expect to sow seed around the world when we don't harvest the fruit in our own home. This brings me right back to full circle. You're saying, Brian, I, I need to be stirred up. Well, you know what? We do all need to be stirred up. God's going to set aside a week where we can just hear his voice. And I get to tell you before we start what he's going to tell us to do. Act on what we already know to do. Act on it. There are opportunities that, that, that you don't even have to leave the building. You don't have to leave your house. You don't have to leave your neighborhood. But he may be calling you to go around the world. He may ask you to leave your home. He may ask you to leave this country. I don't know what God's doing in everyone's heart. But the bottom line is this. We need to be willing to allow him to have us, to use us in any way that he wants to use us. And some of us are scared to do that. I'm scared to do that at times. But you know what? we got to go by faith. So be trained. It's difficult to do the work if you're not prepared for the work. God entrusts his work to those who are trained. That's why the mission is to train faithful men who are able to teach others also. It must be generational. And then be responsible. Take advantage uh, of the advantage of God's promises. And get the seed out of the barn. That's what we got to do this morning. Get the seed out of the barn. There is a need for seed. And so we must start by considering our ways. We consider God's word. And as we th think about God's word, then we will automatically understand the responsibility of God's word. Harold's going to come in this next week. And he's going to encourage us in the word of God. We're going to send out a man, David Pierce, one of our own. This church is going to plant the seed in KCK. Through the word of God, we're going to plant, God literally is planting a church. It's not that we're doing it. We're going to acknowledge what God's already doing. And we're going to rejoice in that. But be careful. Let's not get lazy. We've got to remember to go forward by faith. Because God, there's a lot of people that need to hear the word of God. And some of them are right here this morning in this room. Maybe you don't know Jesus as Savior and you need to be saved this morning. Hey, I would tell you that right now, today, is the day of salvation. Today is the day to make a decision to give your life to Christ, to build upon that foundation a gold, silver, and precious stone, and not wood, hay, and stubble. But God has purposes for you. He has purposes for you in eternity. He wants to move you off a dead sinner so that you can see the blessings that come from sowing his word. Hey, it's intimidating sometimes, the whole thing, the whole church culture thing. Listen, don't make it about that. Make it about you and Jesus. He'll work out all the details. It's you and Jesus. Heavenly Father, we can spend this time and we prepare in just a few minutes for